This is Coding Math, Episode 9, Acceleration. Before I begin today's video, I want to point out three links you might be interested in. One is the new CodingMath.com website, quick place to check out the latest video, subscribe to RSS, etc. Two is the Coding Math GitHub repo, where you can find the code used in each episode. That's at github.com slash bit101 slash coding math. And three is a new site called patreon.com where you can support this show if you find it useful. The link for that is patreon.com slash coding math. This video continues a series on basic physics for programmers that began last week with velocity. To recap, we learned that velocity is a change in position over time and that it's represented by a vector. It has a direction, and it has a magnitude that we usually call speed. And any velocity vector can be broken down into component vectors with the use of some simple trigonometry, so you can talk about x-velocity and y-velocity. Today we'll see that acceleration is the change of velocity over time. It's also represented by a vector, so it has a direction and a magnitude, and it can be represented by two component vectors, x acceleration and y acceleration. And like velocity, there's sometimes some confusion with the term. Maybe it's better to say that there are different meanings of the term acceleration in different contexts. In common everyday use, acceleration usually just means speeding up. We talk about a car accelerating, and even call the gas pedal the accelerator. We talk about medical conditions or financial trends accelerating, mean that they're getting better or worse at a faster rate. But, in the physics sense of the word, acceleration really just means a change in velocity over time. So this encompasses speeding up, slowing down, or even changing directions. Now personally I think that acceleration is one of the most important concepts to understand if you want to program realistic physical motion. Say you get in your car, start it up, and put it into drive. You're moving at a velocity of zero miles per hour at that point. When you step on the gas, you don't instantly start moving at 30 miles per hour. At first, you might be going 1 mile per hour, then 2, then 5, then 10, and 20 miles per hour before hitting 30. As you can see, your velocity is changing over time. Likewise, when you come home, you don't just cruise down your street at 30 miles per hour and then stop dead when you reach your house. You slow down to 20, 10, 5, 3, 2, 1, and hopefully reach 0 miles per hour right at your front door. So that's acceleration applied to speed, but it also applies to direction. If you're driving down the street and you get to an intersection, you don't suddenly start going in this direction. The angle of your velocity will change from this, to this, to this, and finally aligning with the direction of this street. Depending on how fast you're going, you may or may not need to change the speed of your velocity, but you definitely need to change the direction over time. So, when you're programming animated objects, using acceleration can make them look much more realistic. Now let's look at how acceleration works. In Episode 8, I demonstrated an object moving across the screen. It started at a location of 100-100 and moved with a velocity of 5-5. So after the first frame, it was at 105-95. After two frames, 110-90, then 115-85, and so on. On each frame, we simply added the velocity vector to the current position to get a new position. That is constant, unchanging velocity. Now let's do the same frame-by-frame -frame examination of acceleration. We'll keep everything on the x-axis to make it simple at first. In other words, all the vectors will have angles of zero. We'll say our object's initial point is zero and our initial velocity is one. In other words, it's going to move one pixel per frame. Now we'll create an acceleration vector as well. This will also have an angle of zero and a magnitude of one. We'll talk about what units that one is in shortly. So, in the first frame, we add the velocity to the position, and the object has a x position of one. Then we add the acceleration vector to the velocity. Again, acceleration is change of velocity over time. Now the velocity's magnitude, or speed, is two. On the next frame, we do the same thing. Add the velocity, which is now two, to the position, and the object is now at three on the x-axis. Add acceleration to velocity, which now becomes three. Next frame, the object is at 6, and velocity becomes 4. Then the object is at 10, velocity becomes 5. Then 15, and velocity 6, and then the object is at 21. So as you can see, with each frame, this object is moving faster and faster. On each frame, it's moving further than it moved the previous frame. Change of velocity over time. 
So, what about the units of acceleration? We saw that a velocity's magnitude was in terms of distance per a unit of time, such as miles per hour or pixels per frame. Well, acceleration is the change of velocity over time, so it's in terms of distance per unit of time per unit of time. For example, gravity is a type of acceleration. Its magnitude is about 32 feet per second per second. This is sometimes written as 32 feet per second squared. So if an object is stationary, it has a velocity of zero. If it is then dropped, its velocity will be about 32 feet per second after the first second. It will be 64 feet per second after the next second, and 96 feet per second after the third second. So gravity increases the velocity by 32 feet per second every second. So. 32 feet per second per second. In the example we just went through, the magnitude of the acceleration was one pixel per frame per frame. On every frame, the velocity increased by one pixel per frame. Now, let's go through the same example we just did, but in two dimensions. Let's say the object starts here at 0, 100, and its initial velocity is 0, minus 5. So it's going to move straight up on the screen, and the acceleration vector will be 2, 2. So it's pulling the object down and to the right. And I'll just note the acceleration velocity up here as well. First frame, object winds up 0, 95. Velocity changes to 2, minus 3. On the next frame, that puts the object at 2, 92. Velocity changes to 4, minus 1. So we're just adding the acceleration to the velocity each time, adding 2, 2. Add that to the object's position, which becomes 6, 91. Velocity becomes 6, 1. Object moves to 12, 92. Velocity 8, 3. Object 20, 95. So you see that over time, the acceleration has not only changed the speed of the object, but totally change its direction over time as well. Now, the way acceleration works in general is that there's some force acting on the object to change its velocity. An object that is moving at a certain velocity will tend to maintain that velocity, both speed and direction, unless some other force acts on it. So in the example we just did, there was some force acting on the object to change its velocity. Maybe that was a person pulling a rope, a rocket engine, or the gravity of a planet. Or yeah, a magnet. So now you start to get the idea of how useful acceleration can be. Now this method of adding acceleration to velocity and velocity to position on each time step is known as the Euler method. And it's what's known as a type of mathematical integration. In the real world, dividing the forces and motions up into discrete steps like this winds up not being very accurate. In reality, the object might move something more like this. It turns out that the bigger steps you take, the less accurate the Euler method is. In later videos, I'll cover other methods of integration that are more accurate, but I think you'll find that for pretty much any game or effect you might be looking to create, this method will work just fine. All right, it's time to get into some code here, right? Maybe we can replicate this last example here. We'll start off with the second to last example from episode 8, the one where a single particle was moving across the screen. And we'll change the initial position so that the particle starts at the bottom of the screen, and we'll give it a speed of 10 pixels per frame and an angle of minus math pi divided by 2, which is minus 90 degrees. And that will shoot it straight up fairly quickly. Then we'll create an acceleration vector. You might have gotten the idea that acceleration values can be very small, but because they add up over time, they can still have large effects. So rather than 2, 2 like the example, we'll use something way smaller. 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Now all we have to do is add that acceleration to the particle's velocity on each frame. We could do that outside the particle in the update function, but let's pretend that the particle has an accelerate method that takes a vector and adds it to the velocity. In a moment we won't have to pretend. So we just say p accelerate passing in this acceleration vector. Now we jump over to the particle.js file and we add this acceleration method. It takes a vector and it adds this vector to the current velocity. Simple. 
Now we can test this in Chrome. And you can see that the circle starts moving up quickly, but then is quickly pulled down and to the left. Very much like the diagram we just drew. So play with this one a lot. Experiment with different initial velocities and positions and different acceleration values and see what the object does in real time. Now we can move to the last example from episode 8, the lame fireworks, and make them a bit less lame. Like before, we'll create an acceleration vector. We'll call this one gravity. In this context, gravity is simply a force that pulls things down. So we'll initialize it with 0 on the x-axis and 0 0.1 on the y-axis. We'll move the particle's starting position up a bit to height divided by 3, and increase their random speed slightly so that it's something between 2 and 7. Finally, we just add a line saying P, accelerate gravity, in that for loop, so that all the particles have gravity applied to them on each frame. And maybe we'll bring the radius down a bit when drawing the arc for each particle. We launch this in the browser, and we have much improved fireworks. I'm sure you can now improve on this visually with better colors, random initial starting points, and all other kinds of enhancements, but at least you have the physics down. Now since gravity is something we're likely to be using quite often with particles, it's a good candidate to move right inside the particle class. So we'll jump over to the particle.js file and add a gravity property, setting that as null to start, and create will get another parameter, grav. This will be used to create the gravity vector. So we set the y component of gravity to grav or zero. Now grav becomes an optional parameter. If you don't pass a value to it, it will be undefined, and the or statement will resolve it to zero. If you do pass in a value, that value will be used. Then we can move the velocity add to gravity logic right into update. Now back in the main.js file, we can get rid of this gravity variable, and we can get rid of the call to p accelerate. But we'll have to pass in a gravity value when we create each particle. We'll keep that at 0 0.1. And testing that still works as expected. Okay, so a lot of theory here, and just a bit of new code. In episode 10, we'll mainly build on this with some more practical examples of acceleration. See you next week.